Well, hey, who wants to hear another chapter of But I Know I Love You? I know I do. Okay, well, we're in luck. Here's another chapter. Hope you enjoy it. Okay. Forgot where we left off. You know, there's a playlist. There's a playlist if you want to listen from the beginning. Uncertain Answers I could hear the whir of the helicopter as it prepared for takeoff on the floor above us. I walked over to the window and waited until I could see it make its way into the distance. I felt a surge of relief, not just knowing that she was in safe hands, but that we would finally be able to get some answers. I knew I had to tell Gavin what had happened. I rode the public elevator downstairs to the NICU. After I scrubbed, I leaned over his incubator and touched his tiny fingers. Hey, buddy. Your mom is at another hospital now. They're going to find out what happened to her and take care of her. Don't worry. Everything's going to be all right. I love you so much, and we're all going to get through this. Talking to him, but talking to me. As I was holding his hand, one of the nurses I had gotten to know came up. Hi there. How's Camry? I explained that she was being transported to a different hospital for some more sophisticated testing. I hope they can find some answers, she said. Me too, I said. Me too. It was hard to leave Gavin, but I knew I needed to be with Camry too. On the 45-minute drive to the University of Michigan, I thought about the future. It was becoming clear to me that I was going to need a crash course in Baby 101 before we went home. Fortunately, I still had a few weeks before that would happen, but I was still overwhelmed by the thought. How was I going to take care of a baby, visit Camry, and still work? At that point, I just told myself, you've got this. It's all going to work out. Over the next few days, I divvied up my time between learning all I could about taking care of a newborn from the NICU nurses, visiting Camry, taking care of the dogs. By now we had two, and the house, and all the other regular stuff that has to be done. The doctors at U of M were running all kinds of tests on Camry, and while we still didn't have any answers, I felt confident that they were doing all that could be done. One afternoon, as I was driving to see Camry, I got a call from the hospital. They told me that Camry had pulled out all the staples from her C-section and was in emergency surgery. By the time I got to see her, I was horrified to learn that they had to put her in restraints to keep her from pulling out the new staples. Looking at the love of my life, the mother of our son tied to a hospital bed, babbling incoherently, was almost the breaking point. What more could possibly happen, I wondered. How much more can we take? But the worst was yet to come. When I came the next day, I saw her parents outside her room. Her mom had an unusually tense expression on her face, but I chalked it up to fatigue. Lord knows we were all exhausted. I leaned up against the hall wall, propping one foot off the floor, getting myself together before I went in to see Camry. How's she doing? Is there any news? Steve, her mom said softly, her eyes filled with tears. I felt my throat constrict. What is it? What did they tell you? Not a lot, she said. But they told us that they think she has irreversible brain damage. What does that mean? She doesn't know who I am, her mom said. She doesn't know who you are or who Gavin is. She doesn't know any of us and probably never will. I broke down sobbing. I had suspected that Camry might have had something wrong with her brain, but I never expected to hear that she would never recover. Her mom reached out and hugged me, but I was beyond comforting. 
I had never imagined that the worst could be this bad. To be honest, I didn't want to accept it. I was in complete denial. Once I got myself together, I walked into Camry's room. Hey, Cam, how you doing? I tried to sound as normal as possible. She didn't acknowledge me. She didn't even look up. I'm guessing she thought that I was just another doctor or nurse. Camry's eyes wandered about the room. I had thought that her forgetfulness was the result of medication, but I never expected it to be permanent. With trying to sort out this news, it was too painful for me to stay very long, so I gave her a kiss on the forehead. Her dad had come back into her room, and we walked out together to the hall. In that moment, I made my decision. I was never going to give up on Camry. It wasn't going to happen. I was going to be there for her for the rest of her life. I turned to her dad and said, Your daughter might not know who I am today. She might not know who I am tomorrow. But she will in the future. I'm not going anywhere, ever. As soon as I said those words, I knew I had to be with Gavin. I drove straight to the hospital where Gavin was. I knew I had to see him to make sure that he really was okay. I remember driving down the expressway, and I just lost it. I hit the wall. I was sobbing and clenching the steering wheel, screaming in my head, Why? Why did this happen? How could it have happened? I entered the NICU as usual and scrubbed up. I didn't say anything to the nurses. I just walked over to Gavin. I was finally able to hold him, so I scooped him up in my arms. One thing I remember about that day is that he was wearing a bright orange cap. Preemies have to wear hats to keep warm, but this one was a toque, as the Canadians call ski hats. The top of his little head was completely hidden, but his bright eyes looked up knowingly at me. I rocked him back and forth as I explained what was happening with his mom. Hey, buddy, it's not good. Your mom has brain damage and it's bad, but don't worry. Our family's going to be okay. We're going to get through this. I'm not sure exactly what is going to happen, but we're going to make it together. I kissed his forehead and kept saying, it's going to be okay. Don't worry. I'm sure I was talking to myself as much as I was talking to him when I said, I've got this. We can handle it. The nurses kept coming up to me asking how Camry was. Finally, I shared with one of them that she had a traumatic brain injury and lost all her memory. Just doesn't know who she is or who I am or that we have a child. Oh my gosh, the nurse said. Are you serious? Yeah, I said. I wish I weren't, but it's true. That's unbelievable, the nurse said. I am so sorry. She touched me lightly on the shoulder. If there's anything we can do to help. Well, I said, I guess I'm going to be taking care of this tiny baby when he goes home. I don't know the first thing about babies, so give me all the pointers you can. I've said before that the NICU nurses are the best, and they really are. For the rest of the time Gavin was in the hospital, they taught me how to feed and change him. They explained to me how to hold him. They showed me how to bathe him and how to burp him. I can't begin to say what a blessing they all were. They would log in and all take turns helping me figure out how to be both mom and dad to Gavin. One thing strikes me when I look back at the pictures was that Gavin was just a perfect miniature baby with an amazing grip. I still marvel that he could be so strong and so healthy even though he was so tiny. But I never could have done it without the help of those nurses. They were angels. They helped me gain the confidence that I really could take him home and take care of him. By this time, about three weeks had passed since Camry had the brain injury and Gavin was born. The neurosurgeon had explained as much as they knew about it, that she had gone eclamptic and suffered loss of oxygen to the brain, resulting in long-term, perhaps permanent, memory loss. It was clear to me that's what happened because she never knew me when I came to see her. However, I'd still talk to her as if she were Camry. I told her that I would always be there for her, and I told her to be strong because she was going to get better. Once they had figured out what had happened, Camry was downgraded from ICU to a standard room. She was on medication to prevent more seizures, but she was off all other drugs. 
Almost immediately, they began the kind of physical and occupational therapy that they give to stroke victims to see if that could help. Soon, she was able to get up and walk around. It didn't take too long for her to begin making more sense when she talked, but she still didn't have any memory for more than a couple of seconds. She couldn't remember eating, even if the food was still in front of her. She didn't recognize her parents or me. That was one of the hardest things. Every time I came in the room, I was a stranger. To her credit, she wasn't afraid. As I've said, she is one of the bravest, strongest women I know. However, it was clear that she didn't have a clue who anyone was, and she certainly didn't have any idea that she was a mom. After about another week, they decided to release her. Although Gavin was going to stay in the hospital another few weeks until his lungs were fully developed and his feeding tube was removed, I knew I couldn't take Camry back to our house. It wasn't that I didn't want to take care of her. I would have gladly done anything for her, but I was in a tough spot. I had used up all my vacation and sick leave, so I had to go back to work in order to pay my bills. Her parents and I decided that she would stay at their home until we got things figured out. Well, alrighty then. Should be another one soon. And again, playlist. They're, they're, usually we link them at the end of the video if you want to start from the beginning and listen to the whole thing, you know, in one big old shot. Yeah. Um, but anyway, should be another one coming fairly soon.